Ja, das ist das Ganze. Of 
of St. Joseph. Um, I'm sure there are many details in Holy Tradition that tell us why he became a follower of Christ, what miracles he saw, or maybe Christ worked miracles for him directly. We don't really know. This is not revealed in the scriptures, though perhaps in the Holy Tradition. But Noble Joseph is quite interesting. He rises up in this moment with great boldness. He was a follower of Jesus by night. He was not a man who followed openly. And yet he comes, as Blessed Theophilus says, to do a bold deed. Blessed Theophilus says a little bit more that's quite interesting. He says about Joseph that the body of Jesus was headed for probably the common grave. Right? He was executed with criminals, and he probably would have been cast in with them, along with the bodies of the poor who could not afford burial. And Joseph was not willing to allow this to happen. So he goes and he pleads with Pilate for the body. And Blessed Theophilact, you know, kind of supposes or, or considers that he might have even have had to bribe Pilate to pay for him, to purchase this body, which is very interesting. And contrast that with, Joseph, with Judas, who sold a living man, the God-man. And Joseph of Arimathea, out of his love, purchases the body of a dead man, the God-man, and claims this body for honor and for love. As for Nicodemus, he's similar. He's also a man who walks by night, not a man who followed Christ openly. And yet he spoke with Christ, and his conversations with him, with him are recorded in John. And Nicodemus was a man who was transformed by Christ. Uh, we see even in, in the early parts of John, when Christ goes to the temple in the midst of the feast and crawls out, you know, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And the Pharisees fly into a rage over this and condemn him. And, and Nicodemus stands up and says, but can our law condemn a man without first knowing what he teaches? <laughs> and the Pharisees say, are you also from Galilee? You know, search and see. There has never been a prophet from Galilee. So Nicodemus already was turning towards Christ and already had this great love for Christ because of the words he had heard from Christ his interactions. And this love grows to the point in which Nicodemus also has to act, and he acts, and he responds with love. And this love compels him. St. Basil of Ostro, whom we celebrate today, you know, one of Serbia's greatest saints. You know, he lived, he was born in 1610, he died in 1671, in a really bad time. In a time in which the Turks ruled most of Serbia, and those parts of Serbia that were not ruled by Muslims were dominated by Catholics were imposing the unia, unification upon people. Uh, it was a time when Serbs were executed and tortured. There was poverty. There was ignorance. Um, he became a monk at a very early age because of his great love for Christ. He was educated in a monastery, which is probably the only place where there was a school. And he took up the angelic life. And his entire life was a Eucharistic act of thanksgiving to God, sacrificing himself endlessly for Christ. He lived constantly in the state of love. Um, his own bishop followed the Unia, or was sympathetic to it. And St. Basil, as a priest monk, had a very hard place. He had to remain loyal to his bishop, but he also had to preach orthodoxy. And he had persecution from Catholics, from Muslims, from his own bishop. And he ended up going to Russia for a period of time to get supplies for Serbia. And he came back with church articles, with money, with all the things that the Russians graciously gave to him. And then he went to Athos and prayed. And the patriarch of Serbia said, we have to make you a hierarch. And he became a bishop when he was only 28 years old. And he ruled several sees because it was so violent at the time that other bishops fled or were lost. So he had to take under his governance multiple dioceses, not even just his own. And Montenegro is a rough place. This is probably the roughest place in Serbia, where there's mountain clans who have blood feuds with each other and they're very intense. And he would travel between areas. He would visit people. He would preach in houses. And he basically never gave himself rest. He spent his entire life working and laboring and toiling. And no man has the power to do this. No man has even the ambition to do this. He did this with grace, but with love. This love drove him to fasting. This love drove him to prayer. By day he would walk and preach, and by night he would pray endlessly. Uh, he gave up his soul, of course, and from his holy relics have flowed innumerable miracles, miracles that are so many that they're incountable. I mean. I have this book on him that's thick, and most of it is the miracles that he's performed. For, for, of course, for Orthodox, for Muslims, for Catholics, probably for Protestants and Jews who come to visit him. He's worked so many miracles because of his great love, because of the great love that he had for Christ that, that governed his entire life and, of course, governs his eternity. 
This love is so important. This is the driving force. This is the driving force behind St. Mary. This is the driving force behind the noble Joseph and Nicodemus that overcomes fear, that transforms. Of course, this love comes from Christ. Christ is the one who loves us. While we were yet sinners, Christ dies for us. But we have to respond to this in some way. And how do we respond? We have to respond with gratitude and with love. And not with formalism, not with mere obedience, but with a love that transforms the heart. You know, when we pray, we have to pray with love. When we bow before the icons, we have to bow with love. You know, Saint Porphyrios, I'll say this last thing, is a great saint from Greece who died in the 1990s. And Saint Porphyrios had many spiritual children. And they would come to him and they would say, Father, I can't pay attention in church. I can't, I can't, I'm distracted all the time. And I try, and I fight against this distraction, but I'm more distracted. And St. Porphyrus said, yes, try even harder, and you'll be more distracted. He said, and eventually what you need to realize is to not even care about this. Why are you worried about whether you're distracted or not? Because you're not thinking about Christ, you're thinking about yourself. When you come to church, you come only to love. And when you love God, you won't be distracted anymore. Because all you'll think about is Christ. All you'll think about is what he has done for you. All you'll think about is what is present in the church. And you won't even worry about your thoughts anymore, because your thoughts will be governed by God. May it be so with us, brothers and sisters, and may we live like St. Mary of Magdalene, like St. Joseph of Arimathea, the noble one, like St. Nicodemus, and of course, like our father, Basil, the holy hierarch of Austria. Amen.